Good afternoon, my name is Mary McNabb and I am the uh, volunteer in the computer lab at the Kingsport Senior Center. Uh, there's a lot of classes that we offer here at the center, but not everybody has the opportunity to come down and join us. Lots of folks still work or are not really able to come down and we want to give a little bit of an introduction to the computer world to those of you that don't have that opportunity. Um, this is going to be a class in very basic computers and we will be working with uh, what can I do to get access to a computer if I don't have one as well as uh, talking a little bit about if you've got one and you have no idea what to do with it. The two things I hear most from people that come into the lab is somebody gave me this thing and I don't know what to do with it or uh, I don't have access to a computer at home. Is there any point in taking a class? If somebody gave you one, then we're going to talk about the parts of the computer, what they actually do, and how to get connected with the outside world. Um, then we'll see some programs later on that will allow us to do the things that we actually want to do. Um, if you don't have access to a computer, the computer lab here is open all day unless we are having classes and the uh, library is another option for that. Um, one of the things though that people also want to know is if I'm going to uh, buy a computer myself, what exactly do I buy? What do I need? And what are they going to try to sell me that I don't need? So we're going to start out by talking about the parts of the computer. The first uh, and most important part is the central processing unit, which is a square box or a rectangular box that has all the memory and all the important stuff for your computer. If you were to take a computer to the shop and it was a problem with the computer itself and not some other part, that's the only part you have to take, so that's where the brain is. Um, in that, you will find um, two different kinds of mem memory. One is a short-term memory, just like yours and mine. And after it sleeps, that's gone, just like ours. So if it's turned off, you never see that material again. And that's called random access memory. The other is called hard drive memory. And once you store things on it, then you can go back and find them again if you can remember where you stored them. We'll be talking about that at a later time, but it's definitely a question. Um, there are other places on the uh, CPU that allow you to put in storage mediums like uh, CDs and DVDs that you can carry with you from one computer to the other. And all the different um, functions of the computer and all the other parts are plugged in to the back of the CPU. And that's the first thing people say. If I buy one of these things, will I ever get it together? Every plug at the back of the CPU has a separate shape. And that the, there are two that are just nearly similar. They color coded those. So it's really not likely for you to have any problem just plugging in the different parts of the computer to, without having to have a tech. There's no uh, magic to it. And basically, if you can play the little game with your grandchildren, it's a square block and you put in the different shapes, you can probably put together a computer. Another part that we'll be talking about is the monitor. The monitor is the eyes of the computer. When it's on, you'll be able to see what you're doing, where you're typing, how it looks, and all the uh, information like that. Many times by the time you have told the computer what you want it will already have your answers on that monitor screen. Another uh, part that you will be interested in possibly is a printer. Our printer here uh, is just a printer but almost all printers anymore um, print, scan, send faxes, and just about anything else you can think of. Um, and they're relatively inexpensive at this point. But you do not have to have a printer 
to make a computer work. So if you are trying to save money, the printer is something you may want to do later. Next thing is a modem. A modem is a connector between your computer and the internet. Most computers have one when you buy a brand new one. However, it does not work unless you have an internet service provider set up to let your computer actually reach the internet. Um, a modem is just like a telephone. It's got to have a connection line and that is an extra cost. Um, the next thing is your keyboard. The keyboard of the computer is um, where you will actually give a great deal of the instruction to the computer. If you're going to type in information or numbers or if you're going to move the page up or down or several different functions, those are uh, controlled by the keyboard. And another piece of equipment that people just love is the mouse. Most people are afraid of that thing just like it was a real mouse. They don't buy it, they're easy to work with, but you have to remember that the reason that they have a pad underneath them is they have a ball at the bottom and that has to connect with the pad or nothing happens. It doesn't matter how much you swoop that mouse, if it's not touching the pad, you're going nowhere. The mouse actually controls an arrow that's on the monitor screen, and that arrow tells you where you are. A um, couple of terms that we need to talk about are hardware and software. And a lot of people get that confused because they think when they go to the store and buy a disc with some information on it, the disc is the software. Hardware you can touch, software is information. So all this stuff we're talking about is hardware. When you go to the store and you buy a brand new game and it's on a disc, the disc is hardware. That information that makes the um, computer run is the software. And there's two different kinds of software. One of those is uh, application software, which is the games, and different things you want to do. And the other one is operating software. The operating software comes with the computer normally and it's the background information that helps the computer speak your language. That is a, a new innovation of the last 15 years and we're able now to just see the words and not see the transformation from words back to computer speak over and over. There are several different things that the computer does in order to bring your information from raw data to the output that you're looking for. Um, the first thing that has to happen is input. And that is what you tell the computer. And that's exactly what you tell the computer. If you make a mistake, the computer doesn't know it's a mistake, so it acts on what you tell it. Um, if you are in the internet and you type a comma instead of a dot, it's going to say, what would you say? And it's not going to get you where you need to go. Um, a lot of the input devices that you will use are like the mouse and the keyboard. Also, uh, joysticks, um, different kinds of uh, steering wheels for racing games. All the different things that tell it what to do are input devices. Um, once it gets the input, that information goes straight to the uh, central processing unit and the processing unit takes those instructions and does exactly what you told it to do. Uh, once it gets those instructions put together, then it's ready to do one of two things. You can either store your information or you can do um, some kind of output right then. If you go and, and you put a calculator up and you put in a math problem, it gives you the information right there on the screen. Your answer is your output. However, if you write a letter to Social Security that you want to save one of and print another, you, your printer 
gives you one piece of output and the storage becomes a second piece. Now the storage is where you get into a lot of what am I going to do with this? Um, if you're on a public computer like the one behind me, you cannot store your information on that computer. So you have many options as to what you can do, but um, you're going to have to have a medium that's transferable. A lot of folks just simply, if they have email, transfer that information to their email and then um, store it on another device later. Uh, other things you can do are to uh, load it onto a CD, a DVD, an old-fashioned floppy disk that's got about enough room for one uh, piece of information, or uh, onto uh, the new uh, drives that are about as long as a rabbit's foot and go on your keychain. You can get those things as small as a floppy disk for maybe 10 bucks and up to as big as the memory on the computer. So you can actually, for a couple hundred bucks, you can carry everything that you've ever done on a computer on your keychain until it gets lost, which would be my case. The uh, next thing we want to talk about is uh, the mouse itself. There's a lot of information uh, about the mouse that we need to discuss because there are so many different kinds of mouse now. You can get one with the long tail and that plugs into the CPU and gives the information directly to the CPU. That long tail, however, goes every direction except pointing at your screen. So the information goes a long way around and you may be pointing at one screen and the information showing another one. So you have to adjust your movements to where the mouse is pointing and it's a little bit inconvenient. So the solution to that was the laser mouse. Those have no tail and you point them straight at the screen that you're pointing at. Information goes straight from one place to the other. And the uh, biggest drawback is that the uh, tailless mouse doesn't get power from the computer, so it's got to have a battery. And that battery has to be replaced or you're in the middle of something and it suddenly just stops. So you have to remember the battery. Uh, another thing that you can do with the mouse, you can buy one that just has two buttons, one for everyday instructions and the other one for control instructions. Or you can buy one that's got a little uh, round circle in the middle and that thing is to move the page up and down. Um, there's a little bar on the right hand side of every screen that you can just take your mouse and pull it up and down very gently. But a lot of people don't like that so they want to do the little button. The button does one line at a time. Jerk, jerk, jerk. <laughs> Uh, some people get whiplash and some love it. So you will want to try all the different types of mouse if you're getting ready to buy one. Used to be there was a huge variation in the cost of the different types of mouse. There's not really any more. They're basically between 10 and $30 in most cases. And most of the difference in cost is the brand name rather than the features. Uh, don't buy one without a brand name because you'll find yourself with a mouse that there's no company behind. Um, however, that's the only thing that you need to worry about paying a lot for. You can find these things with beautiful decorations on them. Dale Jr.'s picture or something like that. When you are paying extra for one like that, you're paying for the picture, not for a difference in the mouse. Same thing with mouse pads. If you find a mouse pad that has some beautiful picture, you probably pay an extra for it. But the only thing that matters about a mouse pad is simply the grain of the pad. A very slick pad makes the mouse go fast, and a very heavy pad makes it go slow. You want to try different styles of mouse pad 
so that you get the one that works the best for you. If you need a lot of control, you don't want that slick one. So you want to try and find out which one works best for you.